So welcome everyone. I'm Ivy Rivera. I'm a psychic medium, a Thai, you know, Arawak, and I own a school called the Ivy League Psychic Academy, where I train people internationally, online, in everything, ranging from psychic mediumship development to astrology, numerology, tarot, Reiki, children, as well as adults, you name it, we do it. So check out the classes. The link is in the description if you guys need to book a reading or an event with me. Feel free to do that anytime on the website. I have been um, every Monday doing approximately one hour uh, for a show called Ask Ivy here on YouTube and TikTok where I take your personal questions. I have also been posting Roots Revival Interfaith, the church I'm the pastor of. Services here, so you can check that out on YouTube as well. Join us for Sunday service, 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, but I've also started doing, since the pandemic hit, something called the Quarantine Series. That's what we're doing here tonight. So I've been putting up one to two free mini classes per week um, based on things that Spirit has been showing me are needed and necessary and where I have found my students and clients to be at that stage in their development. So tonight is part one of a series of three mini classes we will be doing on shadow work tonight is the basics okay so tonight is shadow work what is it and how do i do it now we will also have coming up part two of the series on june 2nd bringing in our astrologer christina del rey to talk about planetary shifts and different uh, stages in life where you can expect, based on your astrological chart, what is written in your destiny, when you will be going through major uh, phases of shadow work, when it's really important to process all of this. And then we have a part three to this series coming up based on numerology. That's going to be June 16th with... Uh, Reverend Danny Johnson, our numerologist here at the Academy. So both of them will be breaking down the numbers, the planets, what shadow work looks like for you. All right. So tonight, let's start talking about what this is. Okay. So I had posted uh, to the members, you know, does anyone have any questions about shadow work? Is there anything you want me to include in the curriculum? And what do you think it is? Because there's a lot of discrepancy about this. So Bernadette wrote, is shadow work looking at your faults and your weaknesses and then facing the fact that you have them, doing something about it to become a better person? Yes, basically it is. It's a little bit more in depth than that, but uh, that's where you're going to see the benefits really. Then Mary had posted, I have some severe traumas from my past that I don't remember. I remember the age that I was, but how can I do the shadow work when there is memory lost? Well, Mary, that's interestingly enough the way I designed this curriculum. So that's what basically the spirit showed me to do was to look at triggers, be able to see patterns and find it. That's it. Exactly. You're not the only one who can't remember that part of your childhood. That's often a good thing right? We block things out. That's what keeps us alive, keeps us going. Um, but it's not super effective when it comes to doing the healing part of the process. So we will be talking about that. Let's start with the traditional definition of shadow work. What is it? Carl Jung, the psychologist, right? He said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So when Carl Jung referred to shadow work, he was referring to hidden parts of our being that we repress because they cause feelings of sadness or woundedness. And he said that we hide these parts of ourselves from society. So at work with family and friends, all of that, we hide it away because it is read by others as being a weakness and it causes us additional pain and vulnerability. Now, Jung believed in the integration of shadow work for our self-fulfillment to be able to acknowledge who we really are as a whole person and to live in a more balanced way. 
So that's the original definition and interpretation of what Carl Jung was talking about. Here's my take on the modern interpretation and the way people these days are using that term shadow work. I think that today a lot of people are starting to recognize that we are overindulging, excessively consuming healthy habits, spiritual development, even things like organic food, environmentalism, right? Anything that we can latch onto and say, well, I'm taking care of myself. I'm holistic. I'm taking care of myself. I'm developing myself. We tend to overconsume all of that and then very quickly want to pump it out as a teacher. Very quickly want to move right up to the top of the line and become a healer. We very quickly want to become a light worker. We want to start our own blog. We want to start our own uh, circle where we're giving it to others. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have mistaken what we're supposed to be doing as giving it out healing and leading others, we think that that is going to basically intercept all the hard work we have to do. It's going to eliminate all the hard work that we have to do. So it's really important that these rituals, beliefs, and practices don't become the focus for us in our healing journey, our self-development, our spiritual journey, but that they are um, you know, a lovely participant in it. The shadow work itself is really where it's at. And people don't want to have to put in that amount of effort. And a lot of people, quite frankly, don't know how to put in a productive amount of effort into creating something useful. So what I want uh, everyone to be able to do by the end of this class today is to figure out where you have a need in your life for shadow work, how you can spot it, pay attention to the patterns and the triggers, and then utilize these tools that I'm going to give you to get through it so that you can become that healer. You can become that light worker. You can become that therapist. You know, you can become that teacher, that leader, but that is not going to fix it. Okay, putting yourself out there doing that doesn't eliminate the hard work. So we see this very commonly in level jumping. People just want to kind of push off the shadow work and level jump in life. And because it doesn't work that way, what ends up happening is that we get stuck. We get stagnant and it almost feels like your whole life is in a big time out chair. You can't move in any direction until this stuff is dealt with. Uh, we have a free mini class called Level Jumping up here in the playlist if you want to check that out. How to identify when you're accidentally doing that or purposefully doing that, how to stop. All right, so what exactly is preventing us from doing the shadow work? Well, I would say this. Number one, and I've noticed this in my own life, but mostly with my clients and with my students and with others because I do readings for a living, and so I see patterns popping up mostly there. What I notice is that the average person does not want to look at their past. They don't want to sit still and be mindful and examine their present circumstance. And they really don't want to take the time to piece the two together. And if we're not willing to do that, if we're not willing to process, what we're not able to see are the very obvious patterns where we see struggle and loss and bad decision making, repetition of toxic energy and activity. So we're not observing the patterns, number one. Number two, I've also found that the average person really despises the idea of being tested. We don't like to hear that we're being tested by the universe. We don't want to believe that if we make changes in our life, it will lead to more hardships or tests. We don't want to believe that we have to go through a test to earn anything. 
Um, if we think back to school, you know, who enjoyed testing day? Nobody. No one was like, yes, this is it. This is my moment to shine. Nobody wants to go through that part of the process. It's the worst part of the process. So because we don't want to face the reality that the universe is testing us, that life is actually nothing more than a series of tests that you have to pass and learn from until you can graduate up to the next level. Until we accept that, we're doing nothing but hiding from the reality of the situation. Number three, I think we also struggle doing shadow work because we disregard its significance. We live in a world, we live in a society that is all about that instant gratification. And we feel that if there's no immediate payoff, if it's not something tangible, if it's not something materialistic or useful, then it's more of like a suggestion. It's something nice to maybe do one day, or I guess if I feel like it, okay? But it is actually the foundation of all of our future prosperity. All of our wellness and abundance comes from our willingness to do the shadow work. So that is a complete illusion that it's insignificant or voluntary, you know, voluntary. It's not like that. So a lot of people ask, well, what happens, you know, if I never do this work? Well, it's very much like what I tell people when they come to earth with a life contract, there's work they're supposed to fulfill and do. What happens if you don't do that? You reincarnate, you do it over again. You're not gonna get out of this anyways. You will just go around the mountain again and again and again. And so typically what we see is that people are born into this life redoing a lot of shadow work that they didn't get done in the past. So it's old stuff, okay? And you're just reliving it in another way with another family in another circumstance over and over again. Number, what am I on? Number four. Okay, why are we not doing it? Well, a lot of people are lazy. That, that's it. In a very simple way, we don't feel like it. We think there are shortcuts. We live in a society that tells us you can level jump. There are shortcuts. We have gotten more dog eat dog. People are working on themselves less, but cutting their brother and sister more to take and steal. We are lazy. We are not driven to know ourselves. We are not driven to understand the process of life. We're not driven to understand the wisdom of the universe and the difference between light and dark energy. We just are sort of like zombies. We're like sheep. We just do and stick with the status quo. You know, I'm going to get through this and then I'm going to go to college and I'm going to get married and I'm going to have kids and I'm going to retire and I'm going to die in Florida on a condo. That's it. That's like it. Okay. So like if that's what's normal, we are feeding each other's laziness because it's culturally accepted, right? So let's talk about moral licensing, being lazy and using moral licensing. This idea that I've done something good and that's good enough. Or I gave to charity, so that's good enough. Or I took Ivy's psychic mediumship course, and so that's good enough. I gave at church, so that's good enough. I helped the poor. Like, we have this understanding that there's almost like someone watching who gives us a gold star, and then that's good enough. And we're off the hook after that. And that's not the process of life. We have to be realistic that it is a continuation at all times of learning and growing. And when you die, that will continue. Okay, so spirits on the other side aren't doing anything different than what you're doing. Doing it in a different way, but it's all the same idea. It is a continuation. It does not stop, regardless of the good you've done. In fact, I would say this. I think a lot of people don't want to get involved in this cycle because they know intuitively that once they learn a lesson and they do some shadow work, there's going to be another one right around the corner that comes to the surface. And that is a huge part of it. But that's okay. What else are you going to do? Number five, cultural enabling. Everyone is doing their best from wherever they are. Everyone's just doing their best. I cannot stand this saying. When someone says this, I immediately tune them out and I go, whoa, 
you are making an excuse for yourself in your life in some way. That is so untrue. Take a look around you. Do you really believe that everyone is doing their best from where they are? Get serious. It's time to get real, okay? Part of the problem is this cultural enabling. We coddle, we enable because it's easier on us too, right? No one's being held accountable. No one is being forced to take responsibility. Um, you know, there was a time when I thought adults were doing things right, or I was at least told adults were doing things right. Adults were taking responsibility. Adults knew the way. Now, I as a kid kind of knew the difference. I knew that wasn't true based on some of the things I was seeing. But I'm shocked now as an adult that there aren't adults out there doing the right thing, leading in a respectful way. So when we have a bunch of people saying, let everyone off the hook, everyone's doing the best that they can from what they know, we are essentially saying doing nothing is good enough. There are some people who cannot do any better. Sure, that's fine. That has its place. But there are tons of people who are doing the wrong thing or being lazy and they know that they're doing it and they're just not bothering to try any harder. And it affects everybody. Number six, I think there's a lot of fear involved in shadow work because we feel it's like a rabbit hole. We don't know, like when Alice fell down the rabbit hole, that was uncomfortable for her. Um, there were benefits. There were some interesting times. Sometimes she was really enjoying herself, but for the most part, it was chaotic. She felt disempowered and she didn't know when it was going to end. A lot of people are afraid of going down the rabbit hole with their shadow work. They don't know what else is going to come up. They don't know how long they're going to be there. And a lot of people don't want to get invested in therapy because they think that therapy is like a lifelong commitment. They're never going to get out of it. I think that therapy has been abused in a lot of ways. I don't think it is something you're supposed to get involved in, get on meds and stay in forever. It's supposed to be a useful tool. But we have to remember that we have control over this. If you decide to go to therapy, put standards on what your therapy is going to look like. If you decide, I'm not going to just start taking meds and stay here for the next 50 years in sessions with this person, then do that. Set goals and standards for yourself and do the same thing with your shadow work. You have to remember that the universe is not going to bombard you with more than what you can handle. You are going to be in a flow and in a system that respects what you're capable of doing at the time. And then you will be able to move on to the next thing. It's really not all at once, unless you're capable of handling all at once. It's going to be like eating an elephant one bite at a time. Okay? So we need to not allow it to be this big monster that's going to come and consume us. We have to get over the fear and the um, sense of entrapment. Now, how exactly do we do shadow work? Well, we look for the patterns. You have to find it in your life. And it's pretty obvious once you sit and take the time to reflect. But that's really the problem. We aren't comfortable in our discomfort. We have a, a lot of trouble with mindfulness. Now, I'm not talking about deep states of meditation. I'm just talking about sitting still. I'm talking about allowing your emotions, your mind to talk to you. I'm talking about sitting still and allowing your guides, your ancestors to show you things in your life. It's simple. It's you for 10 to 20 minute sessions with a notebook in silence with them. That's it. But sometimes these things will pop up in your life and it's like a punch in the face. And then you realize, here's my ugly pattern again, okay? So let's start with number one, ego. If you have issues with your ego, you could check out the class, how to check your ego here on YouTube. Paul, please put that in the comments. Now, in that class, we talk about the difference between fear and love. We talk about the difference between your ego and your higher mind and things like, um, you know, faith and choosing instead of coming from a place of faith and productivity, positivity 
and love, we come from a place of ego, which is fear and control and manipulation. And it's negative. So when we look at our lives, it's pretty easy to see areas, and we all have them, where we battle ego. If you have areas where your ego often takes control, or you're constantly trying to shove it down, you are trained, you are programmed to habitually come from a place of fear and control and manipulation. You don't have faith in the universe. You don't have faith that things will be okay or that you can go with the flow. That's an area where you need to do some shadow work. Let's talk about number two, another free mini class we have up here. If this is your problem called your fear of leveling up. Okay. A big thing we talked about in that class was imposter syndrome. This idea that you are somehow faking it. This idea that whatever you've earned in your life, you're not deserving of. That people think of you as having certain um, skills or you as being more competent, but inside you don't think that you are. Okay. It's basically like low self-esteem. Now, people have fear of leveling up for a lot of reasons, some of which I talked about earlier. You don't want to level up because you know that with every new level, there's a new devil. You know that if you level up, there's going to be a lot of like testing or hard work or, you know, every time the bus stops, somebody's got to get off. In order for a door to open, another door has to shut. You don't want to go through that process of detox in your life. But that, again, is a sign that you're coming from ego. You're coming from fear. You can't choose to sit still for the rest of your life. You are going to need to level up, okay? So if you have areas in your life where you deliberately throw off your prosperity or you feel that you're not deserving of things, if you feel that people are going to, like, figure you out and you don't deserve what you have, this is an issue for you, okay? There needs to be some shadow work. Number three. Another free mini class we have here called Destiny versus Free Will Future. This is about victimhood mentality. Now, when we come to Earth, we have two different futures. We have a destiny charted future and a free will future. People are confused by this. A lot of people seem to think that it's one or the other, that we are either just like, thrown here on the planet and everything's already written and it's like watching a movie or watching a play, however it plays out, that's how it was always going to play out. And they think that's all there is to it. Therefore, anything they do is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's already written. It's fixed. It's a rigged game. People believe this. There are other people who believe excessively in things like law of attraction and manifestation and there's been a lot of money to be made off of that in recent years, for sure. And they really believe that they control every step of their destiny, that they can want or create some crazy thing that they have no business having and they will get it if they believe enough. That's also not the case. It is a combination of both. We see this in numerology. We see this in psychic mediumship. We see this in astrology. We see this in reality. We have two futures. You have things written in the stars, let's say, that are, in fact, destiny charted. When I read my clients, I will say to them, this thing is going to happen. I can tell you how it's going to happen. I can tell you when it's going to happen. What I can't tell you is what you're going to choose to do with it. I cannot guarantee what the outcome will be because you have free will. Everyone else involved has free will. We cannot really move forward and do shadow work in our lives if we think we're a victim to the circumstances of life and everything's already written. We have no control and we can't really do the shadow work if we don't understand that certain things are destiny charted, that we do have a specific purpose, that there are things that are for us to manifest and some that are not. Okay, so if you struggle with this, it's time to do some shadow work in that area. This will lead you to feeling far more empowered and like you understand what's going on in the world too. All right, number four, Love versus fear, similar to ego. We have a free mini class on this one. Let's talk about your decision making. That's what this class was all about. 
when it's time for you to speak, when it's time for you to make a move, or when it's time for you to make a decision about something, do you tend to make all of those decisions based on your fears, things that you want to avoid, circumstances that you don't want to see happen, stuff that's happened in the past that's haunting you, or do you come from a place of love, positivity, faith? manifestation. I want more. I deserve more. I'm going to go get more. Where do you make all your decisions? From where? If you find it's coming from a dark place, it's time to do some shadow work. I want to use the example of being caught up in a bad marriage. Woo. Let's talk about 80, 90% of my client base, right? They won't leave a bad, toxic marriage because they're worried about the mortgage, they're worried about what might happen with their job or how consistent things might be. Nowadays, they're worried about like, COVID, they're worried about the kids, they're worried about how the kids might take it, they're worried about court, they're worried about the lawyer, they're worried about the whole process. They would rather stay there knowing it's like a ticking time bomb. Sometimes that time bomb already went off and they won't even leave the wreckage. They'll stay there in that war-torn situation because they are coming from a place of fear. They don't want to decide that the most loving thing to do for their children, the most loving thing to do for themselves, the most loving thing to do for their soon to be ex is to let it go. Yeah, that may be an area you need to work on. That's just an example of one thing that we commonly see. Okay. So ask, what is the loving thing to do? Number five, you may need to do shadow work if you don't know how to stay in your lane. Another free mini class we have up here on the playlist. We know that this is a problem when we see unhealthy boundaries or a complete and total lack of boundaries. If you have wounded healer syndrome, if you're always pushing your agenda on other people, your mind is always preoccupied with how other people need help or could do better, if you find yourself over giving and not receiving, if you find that you have a martyrdom or victimhood mentality, why do I never get back what I put out? Things like this. This is all connected to you needing to stay in your lane. Now, a lot of people have like a God complex. They really do feel so haunted by some overwhelming responsibility to fix things in the world around them that it steals their rest and their sleep, they can't recoup, and they're in a constant downward spiral where they cannot rejuvenate themselves. It's this. I also want to talk to the activists out there, people who are trying to make good change, but it's such a long process and a long journey. You know, you guys are also really susceptible to this. And while your intentions are good, be careful Remember that you can't spread yourself too thin. If you're going to get into one area of activism, get into one area of activism. If there isn't an outlet for what the change that you want to see, then create something. But don't just be on 50 different meetings, you know, four or five days out of the week, spreading yourself so thin and not accomplishing anything. You're not called to do everything. You're only called to do what is within your life contracts. People need to learn to stay in their lane. This is a problem for you. Maybe you're a helicopter parent, okay? Or you just, you tend to worry about your spouse and the kids and then that consumes your mind and then you're over giving it like with your family and you know, your extended family. Like when are you a priority? Well, you're not staying in your lane. And as many times as people wanna say, well, this is an honorable way to be, a lot of it is coming from a lack of doing the shadow work. It's not. It's just that you're avoiding your own stuff. Number six, the still small voice. Another free mini class we have up here. The still small voice is your intuition. It is your higher mind. Sometimes it's like your inner child. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. It is your angels, your guides, your ancestors. In the still small voice, the right side of our brain, we could say, we tap into healing information. We tap into guidance that is being given for our highest and best good. But I have sadly found that most people have no clue that this voice exists or they really don't know how to listen to it because they have chosen to shut it out since they were kids. 
So if you find that you don't know the difference between your intuition and your emotion, you don't know the difference between your intuition and your logic, or every time you have a problem or a decision to make, you can't just go with your gut instinct without being double-minded and backpedaling and being unsure of yourself. You have to go to everybody else outside of you and ask for advice. You have to look at the circumstances outside of you. You have to see what's going to happen next. Well, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for more proof. If this is you, you don't know how to listen to your still small voice. And you need to do shadow work in that area. What has taken that from you? That actually fits in nicely with the church series that we've been doing the mm -hmm. last three weeks, two weeks. Two weeks. So at Roots Revival Interfaith, the church, and these are up here also, we did faith versus fear and worry. And then um, last Sunday, we did faith versus emotion. And this upcoming on Valentine's Day, we're doing faith versus logic. Okay, so pay attention to your still small voice and doing shadow work in that area, if that sounds like you. Number seven, speak up your fear of speaking out. Who has a closed throat chakra? Who doesn't speak their truth? Do you sometimes avoid speaking your truth because you don't want to rock the boat or you don't think it's going to be effective? Do you find that even when you do speak your truth, it's disrespected, it's disregarded, it's ignored. And then you don't follow up with healthy boundaries. You don't create the change that's really needed. A lot of people don't want to speak up because once you rock the boat, you got walk, you know, you got water in the boat. You got people that are unhappy with you. We did a class on this as well, and that's up in the playlist called Speak Up Your Fear of Speaking Out. We have to get over what other people are going to do as a reaction to us speaking our truth. And if you don't know how to do this, you may have been raised with an alcoholic parent or an abusive parent, a neglectful parent. You may have been raised in a family that had a lot of stress, mental illness or disease. Maybe your childhood was kind of taken away from you. We see parentification. We see a child who becomes the adult too early on. You know, did you, were you marginalized? You know, are you a minority? Were you silenced? Where did this come from? Why do you have a fear of speaking up for what is rightfully yours, how you feel, what you believe? Let's get to the root of it. That's a sign of a need for some shadow work. Number eight, hate less, forgive more. Another free mini class that's up here. This is about, and this is the worst one because society feeds it. It's okay not to forgive. It's okay to stay angry. That's part of the natural human reaction and process. Yes, it is. But part of evolving beyond human reaction, okay, is letting go. So we're not just human beings. We're not just animals. We are spiritual creatures having a human experience. Let's not forget the second half of this. Just because you're supported in society, told you don't have to forgive, you don't have to forget, doesn't mean... You're not obligated to do it if you want to receive your blessings, if you want to receive your prosperity, if you want to level up and grow and learn and be able to lead and help others eventually. Yes, you do need to do it. It does not require that the other person who hurt you is involved or the system that disrespected you is involved. This is just about a journey inward. There is a need, okay? If you are hateful, you are angry, if you have bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart, you have a block to your prosperity. This will eventually manifest into mental health issues and health conditions. I can't prescribe or diagnose, but I would say that's pretty much a guarantee. I see this one every day. Yes, it's hard. It's the toughest one, not only because once we've been hurt, we don't want to go there again, uh, but also because it is so supported with this cultural enabling. So do some shadow work if you notice this. Hate or a lack of forgiveness in your heart. Number nine, finding the one. This is a free mini class we're going to be running on June 23rd based on a two hour training I have up on the website called Reaching the One. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about a lack of love. Let's talk about toxic love partners, patterns of toxic relationship behaviors here. So finding the one is about Knowing that you want to be with somebody, 
but clearly not being ready to authentically be yourself in a balanced way. Therefore, you just keep attracting toxic love partners to you. So when we talk about who we choose or through law of attraction manifestation, who we attract because of the energy we're putting out, you know, we are really talking about what we're giving off. Now, there is an exception to this. When we talk about empathic people, it's a different story. In the empathic training, I talk about how empaths are the number one group research shows to attract sociopaths and narcissists. That is a different thing. I'm not pooling you together in this. That's a separate problem that empaths have. But if you are aware of that pattern, even if you are an empath and you still allow it, you're not getting to the root of it. That's shadow work too. Okay. So why do we accept or have toxic love partners? And I'm not even just talking about romantic. Anyone in your life that you have put in a position of honor that you give time and attention to, thought to, all the time, why are they there if it is not good for you? That's a place where you need to do some shadow work. Number 10, psychological projection. Okay, Having a perceived personal inferiority. And then seeing other people, okay, as being morally deficient. So this is essentially just projection. This is blaming others. Are you the kind of person who can't look at yourself? Now, a lot of people say, well, that's just ego. Yes, that's part of it. But let's look a little deeper at this. Do you find things wrong with everybody? Do you find things wrong with every situation in your life? Every time something goes wrong, are you just like having a hissy fit? And it's like, well, this shouldn't have happened. And that shouldn't have happened. Are you a Karen? Are you complaining to the managers all the time? Is it always somebody else's problem? Do you never look at yourself? Okay. Psychological projection. Time for some shadow work. Time to deal with you. You shouldn't have to fight that much. Okay. People aren't that wrong. Things aren't that wrong. Number 11, okay. you need to look at your triggers. So one easy way to find areas where we need to do shadow work is to know the systems, astrology, numerology, and your life contract. When I do a life contract reading, I look at what people signed on to before they came to earth. I will see something called pivotal points. These pivotal points that spirit shows me match. Yes, I've done the legwork, 10 years of it. They match what is written in Western Vedic astrology as well as numerology. So it's all kind of the same thing. It's, it is the same thing with different labels and different people read it in different ways. Uh, but it is about points, pivotal points, where the person is going to be tested and the person in that test is hopefully going to see it as a karmic opportunity to reach a higher level of prosperity. They want to use that test and those lessons to activate that prosperity, to become more empowered, and ultimately to give it out to others and to the universe around them. So these triggers are literally written in the stars. Now, any where you need to do shadow work, guess what happens? The minute you have that pivotal point, the minute there's an opportunity for growth and development, here come all the opportunities for shadow work. It's like volcanic. It can feel um, very much like a drudging up of skeletons in the closet and stuff from the past. All right. The universe will provide you with plenty of opportunities to deal with it wherever you are in life at that time. So check your astrology, your numerology, your life contract, understand where your pivotal points are. And when there are also planetary movements going on that are all about the shadow work, isn't it Pluto? Do we have Christina Del Rey tuned in here? She's not. But... I, I, well, we have her coming on for part two of this series, June 2nd, and she'll talk more about that. But I believe it's Pluto and Uranus, maybe, that are the, um, that really deal with the darkness, right? Mars, too, in your 12th house. These are all things hidden in the shadows. So when those areas are activated, be mindful. Number 12. This has worked for me really, really well personally. 
um, dealing with my shadow work because of um, patterns I've noticed in my own life that are always sort of saying, unfinished business, unfinished business to the past. Let's take a look. And that is having flashbacks. Uh, for example, I had a terrible childhood. I was kicked out at nine years old. I was out on the streets by 13, 14. Had my first apartment when I was 15. Any years I was home, it was a horrible idea. I should have been removed. And so because of this, I learned to block. And that's a lot like Mary's question that we opened with. I tuned it out. I blocked it out. How do you do the shadow work if you blocked it out? Well, here's one thing. I waited until I had flashbacks. And when I would have traumatic flashbacks, I then would go and work through it and do the shadow work. Sometimes I needed a therapist to help and support me. Sometimes I was able to do it with some mindfulness and meditation. Sometimes I can call in my guide. Sometimes I need a book. I need to go to Barnes and Noble and I need to focus in on that thing. You know, there are so many ways, especially with technology today, you know, in the eighties and nineties, we didn't have all this. So it was a lot harder back then, but I spent many, many years watching for things like flashbacks. I still do. You never know what's going to come up or when. Sometimes you think you've gotten through something and it's like crabgrass. It's like whack-a-mole. It comes up again. It comes up again. It could stay hidden for years even, you know, two years, five years later, comes up again. But that's part of the life process. And shadow work itself is not meant to be all in one fell swoop. You know, you didn't get injured and carry it for as long as you did just to have it cleaned up in one fell swoop. It can come in in one fell swoop. You could take one beating and it'll last the rest of your life. It takes a long time to clean it up, okay? But that's okay, that's normal. Now, I also pay attention personally to nightmares. If I start to have patterned dreams that are toxic, negative nightmares and I'm in my childhood house or I'm dealing with those abusive family members, I'm going through something. I know whether the nightmare is symbolic or it's literal. I'm remembering these things or back in those places. I know it's time to do a little more shadow work. And again, it doesn't come all at once. Okay. It will come when you're ready to deal with it. But if you don't deal with it, it's going to become overwhelming. All right, for those of you who deal with that, I have a dreams class up on the website that also focuses on subconscious dreaming and processing and lucid techniques that you can use to help you check it out. Another thing that I've noticed with my own self is the veil getting lifted between the worlds. So as I'm dozing off or as I'm waking up and the veil is lifted and thinnest between the worlds, I am my most authentic self in that moment, because I feel, because I am who I really am. I am so conscious, but I am also like coming back into my normal everyday life here on this earth plane, you know, so all that logical stuff is about to step in and block. It's almost like this is really where I try to walk the line every day in my life. Well, in those moments when I'm dozing off or I'm waking up, if I start to have troubled thoughts, I know I need to do shadow work in that area. A lot of people joke about this. I see a ton of like TikToks where people are falling asleep and they joke as I'm dozing off. I think of how I embarrassed myself and the ridiculous thing I said, and how I made this mistake and how I have this regret and you know how I feel bad for something I did. Well, that's all shadow work. We need to not just blow that off and say, well, that's unfortunate. I'll have a glass of wine and fall asleep eventually or pop a sleeping pill. Let's use these, okay, opportunities as tools. All right, let's talk about the last one, number 13. Embarrassment, stagnancy, and procrastination. Now, I pulled these together because I find that they often coincide. I will notice that I'm reading people and they're super stagnant, where they don't ever want to step out in blind faith and try something new. They need to have all their ducks in a row. And even when they do, they still won't make a move. And they also seem to carry a lot of embarrassment or embarrassment and low self-esteem. They're very critical and judgmental of themselves. They obviously procrastinate. If they are going to do anything, there's a ton of procrastination. And they try to say, well, you know, I'm lazy. You're not lazy. You're fearful. You need to do shadow work. You are afraid of accomplishing something. 
And where does that level of embarrassment and shame come from? You know, is there guilt connected to this? I often see that, especially where the procrastination and the stagnancy is concerned, because maybe they feel guilty for maybe achieving their dreams or people feel guilty for growing and developing because they have a spouse that won't or they have family members who, you know, won't be able to go on the journey with them or someone's suffering. And so therefore I should just not have this for myself. You know, why are we embarrassed? Why are we stagnant? Why are we procrastinating? Stop saying it's lazy. It's based on fear. And that is a sign that you need to do some shadow work. All right. So those are the 13 steps. I want to talk about why this is useful. Why should you go through all this? Well, you know, it's up to you. You'll just have to redo it if you don't. So, I mean, I would just to save time. I believe that life is an opportunity to be efficient and get things done. Um, so it's just kind of common sense. But let's talk about some other areas that you're going to see um, benefits in. And this, I guarantee, like I promise you this, okay? When you take a step forward in blind faith or you do some shadow work, you really put effort in in a positive way. You shift the energy that you put out to the universe and immediately you start to get good karmic payout. And so red lights turn green, business opportunities open up, you meet new members of your soul tribe, all kinds of things will happen. It is immediate, okay? But um, based on research, people who do shadow work uh, see improved relationships, healthy boundary setting, increased happiness, increased energy, improved immune systems, more stable moods, mm -hmm. better communication, and they cease self-destructive cycles. That one right there would be worth it alone. Okay. Do we have questions or comments? Lenny, uh, I do like that you brought up uh, immune the immune system. The immune system. A lot yeah. of people are sick, and because people don't people don't want to face that a lot of their health problems are spillover from a past life where they had these same identical issues where they didn't do the shadow work. They don't want to admit to that because that's way too far out. Okay, but even in their own lives, they can't find the root cause, yeah. and neither can the doctors. You know, what is happening? Well, we have a manifestation from our mental and emotional state. We have a manifestation in the actual physical body from our energy, period. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, a thyroid issue, you know, mm. people like, oh, it's an autoimmune thing. It's autoimmune. Okay. And, you know, you get on pills, but then, you know, you handle your issue and uh, it goes away, you know, and it, so it wasn't autoimmune at all. You know, it's uh, right. Well, and when we see things with the closed throat chakra, like I mentioned earlier, you know, we can read the throat as a timeline. So I tell my students, this is the past, this is the present, this is the future. And when we feel pressure in the throat, a choking, um, you know, sometimes you'll just notice that you're coughing a lot, that it's almost like a dry cough, or you start to have sinus problems, you start to have thyroid issues, esophageal problems, you know, acid reflux, all of this is a sign that something wasn't said. Now, it may be from your past, it may be going on now, and it may be a problem you're going to have in your future. But we can absolutely measure something like that. And there isn't any kind of pill in the world that a doctor can give you to fix it. You have got to speak in the right way at the right time and do that shadow work. Yeah. yeah. Amy said that... Uh... Something she's been had to work on for the past couple of months is, months is fear of judgment for what I'm saying. She said, I have a big mouth, LOL, but with my reading slash intuitive hits, I tend to back down. What does that mean, reading intuitive hits? Uh, when she's giving readings or has her intuition kicks in, she backs away from it. But. Backs away. Okay, so this person is trying to give readings out to others um, and is finding that there's some shadow work that needs to be done before she can really properly heal others. And help others um, because she's afraid of judgment, which is ego, yep. which is ego, which means that so Amy is dealing with a, a struggle of um, ego instead of faith. And so what she's trying to do is control and manipulate. And so you probably have other areas of your life where you control and manipulate. And the idea of having to let that go is probably pretty terrifying, you know, but you're being confronted with it. 
um, as you're trying to give readings to people and you're afraid of their judgment. So it's a great opportunity to look at all areas of your life where you manipulate or control. Portia says that when she speaks up, she gets ignored or just disrespected. So she's just staying quiet. Mm. So that is the speak up your fear of speaking out class here on YouTube. Definitely watch that. We talk about that. This is about you deciding it's not about them. It's about you. It's the moral of it. It is time to speak out. And it is about a test you're going through in the universe, in your life contract, for your own self-development. They have nothing to do with it. It's about whether or not you show up and you do what's required of you. And if you don't, you're allowing them to steal your prosperity. Uh, this one is from the good Reverend Danny Johnson. Ah? Uh? says, thanking you for speaking out on activists. Uh, when working to change systems and see little improve, they potentially internalize lack of social change as their own fault. Yes. So um, thank you, Danny. So Danny's an activist as well. We did a um, anti-burnout training. It was uh, an empathic awareness training, but it was for all activists and protesters. If Paul, if you could put that in yep. the um, comment section where we talked really in depth about this. Um, and Danny was part of that also attended and I think that's so important to remember, not even just activists, but those of us who are born into families where we feel we need to caretake over others. Um, a lot of people are born into different cultural you know, situations where it's their responsibility to let their family come into their lives all the time and sort of dictate and maybe even live with them or you know, you're responsible for taking care of your elders. There's a great way to look at our responsibility to others and stay in a healthy mentality with good structured boundaries and say, I have a certain amount that I am supposed to be giving others. And then there is also my space where I need to stay in my lane. And if we don't know where those lines are drawn, it can become an all consuming thing. Yeah, and activism is a really common place to see that. Um, because a lot in the same way where people who overgive to their families or their spouse or their kids or whatever, you don't always see back. You could give to your kids forever and end up alone and you never hear from them. That happens too. So we can give and not see payout. And that's okay. As long as we understand that it's part of our calling, it's where we're supposed to be. It's something we're supposed to give that still allows you to have a good, healthy sense of accomplishment. And kind of like the girl previous was saying, they don't listen to me, so I don't talk. It's not about them. It's not about the outcome, okay? So that's what service is. That's what living and abiding within your life contract is or giving love unconditionally. It's all about giving because you're supposed to, not because there's a demand for it or you're expecting a payout. And so it makes it easier, especially for activists, to just say, okay, well, I did what I was supposed to, and that's it. You know, again, all of this is like eating an elephant. It literally is one bite at a time. These things take a long time, and that's okay. We're contributing. We're doing the right thing. Uh, we have one from Rachel. Uh, when we were talking about throat, she said, that makes so much sense. I've had throat issues for most of my adult life. And earlier she had asked, if most people in my life seem toxic, does that mean that I am the problem? Well, yes, because you're not, you're not owning it, but we have to look at whether or not the energy you're putting out is basically toxic in the way that it's attracting some people that are similar to you. Is it toxic in the way that you're subservient to others? And so you're willing to just be a martyr and a victim and be abused by them? Is it not toxic, but attracts toxic in the way that empaths, especially at the third and the fourth levels, put out so much healing energy that they attract people who want it and need it? Vampires, narcissists, sociopaths, you need to figure out what the answer to that is. That's the root. That's the real question here. And once you know what it is that you are, what it is 
that your energy says to the world around you, then you'll understand who and what you're attracting. I think it's important to, um, and for anyone who's hearing that, especially about the narcissists and the sociopaths, the class is called Empathic Awareness. It's up on a different website. Paul can put that in the comments. It's at um, IvyRiveraEmpathicEducator.com. When we are born into toxic situations, we are often reliving past life issues that are unresolved, karmic contracts. We have to overcome those. And so sometimes we want to blame ourselves and we say, well, am I attracting all these toxic people? Make sure you didn't just like land on the planet with them. Now you would have chosen them. Don't forget that too. You know, if this is mostly family you're talking about, you did choose them before you came to earth, but only to test yourself, only to grow, only to have an opportunity yet again to finish that karmic work and eventually learn how to get out of those toxic abusive relationships. So sometimes, you know, it's that. But the real issue is the lack of boundary setting. This one is from Bugsy. Okay. How do you know the difference between toxic and need to work in the relationship? Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, I think honesty is a big part of it. I think that, to put it simply, you know if you're with a love partner who has a growth mindset. What does their past look like? What do their relationships look like? Has this person ever worked on themselves before? Okay, we see a lot of people get together and all of a sudden they want to clean their acts up because they want to be worthy of being in that relationship or with that person. Is that authentic? Do you believe that this is an individual who shows in pattern throughout their life that they can be introspective, do the work, set goals, do they show character, morality, do they have a moral compass? Is there integrity there? Or is that has does this person just like they're hot, you know, and it's kind of like a sexy thing and like we I would like to have it work out and it's chaotic, but there's a lot of passion there and we just keep sort of coming back together. And you're the only one steering the ship. You're the one running the show. You're the parent. You don't have a partner. You're the parent of the relationship. You know, there are some really obvious signs. I find that even people that are really crafty at covering it up cannot cover up that they don't have a growth mindset. They can't. They can't hide that one. So you should never get involved in a relationship where you don't have two people with a growth mindset. Because ultimately, one's going to outgrow the other one. The one who's getting left behind is going to try to trap them and keep them down, right? Or like, it's just going to be sad. It's going to, it's going to fall apart. If we want to have the opportunity for growth, then we have to have two people like that. So just try to focus there and be honest about what you see. And if the answer is, you know, yes, this person um, does work really hard on themselves, then I think the smart thing to do is to treat it like it's a business and to put a certain amount of time on it and say, this is what I'm going to need. Because that's the truth anyways. I'm going to need A, B, and C in this relationship. And I'm going to need it by this time. And if they can sign on to that contract and contribute, then we can work with something. Um, but if they can't maintain that growth and development, if they're going dark, then it is what it is. You got to cut it loose. Uh, from Crystal. Okay says that different areas of her life are impacted by different areas of shadow work needs, like love versus fear, uh, health because of old experiences, or imposterism at work. Uh, do I focus on them all or just one? Well, I think that's up to you. I, it sounds like you have a lot coming up. Maybe you're going through an awakening right now. Sometimes when we go through a kundalini, an awakening, um we find that we get sort of bombarded with a whole bunch of stuff at once. For those of you who have gone through a download, we have a class on that here, a free class called Receiving the Download. Sometimes when you receive a download, it can happen. Um, it, it sounds to me like there's a lot. And it sounds to me like you're ready to handle it just by the way you wrote that question out. Just because you were so like able to identify it, I feel like you could probably juggle it. There isn't any way to understand that it's required and then not do it anyhow at this point and with the mentality and personality you have. 
you can't identify, you know, that there's a starving dog over by your garage and there's a cat that's homeless outside your work and that like, you know, uh, someone's begging you to take in their, you know, abandoned chihuahua. And you can't just be like, well, I'm not going to do any of that. You're going to keep a bag of food in your car. You're going to start leaving a bowl out. And you know you're going to place that dog with someone else if you have to. There's no way to just be like, I'm just going to ignore this and keep going forward. It will become so loud that it's overwhelming. It could almost like eat you up, you know. So I think that what's happening is you are at the right time. And you have to know that you have help. Your guides... Your angels, your ancestors, this is literally what they're here for. So if it gets overwhelming, you know, you want to call them in for help in that area. But um, I would journal it, too, you know, because it is a lot. Keep things in perspective. This is from Ellie. Okay. She's asking, is it harder to do shadow work for empaths than normal? I don't think so. Um, I think, if anything, we're really skilled in this. I think that... What we have going for us as empaths is our sensitivity level and our intuitive intelligence. So, you know, we're not dummies. We're not going to overlook stuff like a lot of other people will. Like people will overlook stuff into their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And like we catch on real quick. Like you're 15, 16, 25. You've already got this stuff done. We have a way of being honest about the energy itself. And because that energy is undeniable, um, I think that it's extra push and motivation, but like in the best way. I think that the other thing we're sensitive to is deadlines. A lot of people don't understand that there are deadlines. It's like, well, you've got your whole life. No, you don't. And depending on what came up in your life, you may literally only have six more months or two years, you know, whatever to do things. I think that empaths are highly in tune to that and we understand it as pressure and compressing. And so, you know, even things that are really difficult for us to do with them because we're highly sensitive, you know, it may, it may seem like more or feel emotionally or mentally like more. We also understand that it's like now, 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 quick, now, go. And so it's like a band-aid, you know, whereas other people will just sort of linger in that energy and let it go on for far too long. And quite frankly, I think that's more painful. I think sitting and stewing in toxicity is far more painful than quick off like a Band-Aid. And I find that embeds are pretty bold in taking stuff, you know, and removing it, processing. So I hope that you guys are all starting your shadow work journey. I hope that this helps. These are the basics. This is the foundation. Again, Carl Jung, look him up, read, you know, on the history of, of what he meant by all of this. Um, and remember that there's no sugarcoating this. You just have to do the work. Remember that it will not end. It's one lesson after another, after another, after another, not only from this life, but also from your past lives. And that's okay. That's life. That's the human experience and the spiritual experience. We will have part two to this series, looking at the astrological aspects of it uh, coming up with Christina Del Rey, our astrologer here at the Ivy League Psychic Academy on June 2nd. And then the third part of this series will come up June 16th with Reverend Danny Johnson, our numerologist here at the Academy. So we'll look at shadow work from a couple other angles where it's a little bit more predictable. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you, Polly. You're very welcome. Thank you, Spirit. Have a great night, everybody.